Hi everybody. Welcome to Ufi Connects number I have no idea. Um, there have been a lot of them and I am delighted to say that this will be our final Ufi Connect session um, for 2021. And I am really, really excited about this topic and I am incredibly excited about where we are with it. I imagine many of you on the call today are aware that we have been doing an awful lot of work around data ownership. Um, this was a discussion that started, honestly, probably pre even this, but the first recollection I have of us really picking up on it was at the um, European conference uh, that was held online uh, during the spring this year. Um, and it has really continued and developed since then. What we are thrilled to be talking about today is probably the last conversation on the data ownership debate, uh, at least under its current guise. We feel like the group has, well, the industry really has kind of embraced this concept. We feel like we are much clearer on it. The relationships between organizers and suppliers is much um, more defined and it's a really open conversation. So we are excited to kind of move this along into the next chapter. Uh, to do that today, you will have some expert panelists. Uh, I believe some of these will be familiar to you. And you will now need to hear no more from me, as I will hand this over to Paul Woodward, who will be moderating the session for us today. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Good evening. I see some uh, faces from Asia, including the UFI president. So hello, Monica. And uh, good afternoon to those of you in Europe and a, and a few good mornings from uh, from from the Americas as well. So very nice to see everybody here and a very late evening to Joanne Kellaway in Sydney, I see. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I think the, the, the number of, of people and the, uh, the, the, the range of places that you're all dialing in from is clear indication of just the, uh, the, 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 the level of interest that has been generated by this topic as Caitlin just described, we had, um, uh, several sessions, uh, several virtual sessions earlier in the year, then a, then a real life session on stage with uh, three of our four panelists here um, uh, in, in Rotterdam. Um, one of the, the, the outcomes of that was people coming up to, well actually mainly to the panelists, they weren't interested in what I was saying, but they were very interested in what the panelists were saying. Uh, and saying to them really half an hour wasn't enough, we want to get into much more, we, we've got all sorts of interesting things, more, more that we want to discuss, this is such an important topic. And I think um, um, a couple of the, the panelists in, um, in, in Rotterdam uh, made it clear that what has happened over the last sort of 18 months, one of the clear things that's happened is that uh, the sort of the data and the way that we manage data has come really to the center of what we're doing in our business and the future of our business and um, I think James you you wrapped up right at the very end of our, our session in Rotterdam saying that you thought the sort of the evolution of this over the next 12 to 18 months was going to be the biggest opportunity in our industry that we've seen for a long time and it was it was nice to close a session when we were all worried about a few other things going on in the world nice to close a session with a uh, with a, a a thought about a big opportunity for everybody um now given that the that one of the rationales for coming back to this topic again um was the um uh, what was the fact that there were a lot of questions We'll be keeping an eye on the chat here, and as, as we go through the next uh, so, uh, 55 minutes that we have remaining, any questions, please put them in the chat, and um, so long as we're not overwhelmed with the number of questions, we'll invite you up to come and join us. Uh, we'll open up the mic. I think the UFI team only has the, the, the ability to do that, so they'll unmute you and when we invite you and come and ask a question. Um, because we really want this to be as interactive as possible. And as, as Caitlin said in that brief introduction, I think what we'd hope to do really is to sort of wrap up on this issue of data ownership. It was, it was launched in, a, in an UFI Connect session with a quite vigorous debate as to whether um, who the data belongs to, whether it belonged to the organizers, whether it belonged to the tech companies, whether it somehow belonged to both of them or 
possibly whether it belonged to the participants in our events. Um, in, in many ways, it seems that that particular debate is almost over. In fact, the person who launched the debate, one of the tech service providers stood up in Rotterdam and essentially admitted as much and said that debate is really over. The data clearly belongs with you, the organizer. So maybe the ownership issue, we don't need to spend too much time on today and we can move more on to um, what we can actually do with this data and how we manage the data and perhaps sort of touch a bit on what James was talking about, about what the opportunity is. And um, we, we also spoke a little bit briefly at the end in Rotterdam as well about the um, intersection between our sort of legal and uh, yeah, our, our, our sort of legal commitments, what we have to do with the data and how we have to manage it and the business opportunity and how those sort of two streams come together and perhaps can come together in a productive way rather than a problematical way. So um, we have got a couple of or several polls um, uh, lined up here perhaps to get the discussion started. So Pascal, if I could ask you to fire up the first question just to get everybody perhaps and uh, give us your thoughts here and we're going to leave this up for about 20 or 30 seconds. So let's try and get some, um, thank you very much. I can see some of you are starting to vote. Basic question here, have you changed any of your plans or behaviours regarding your data handling and processing over the last 12 months? Um, well, don't be shy, don't be shy. There are, we're going to kind of wrap it up in five, Four, voting, keep voting, three, two. Okay, let's end the poll at this point, Pascal, if we can, and share the results with everybody. Okay, so the vast majority, so a substantial majority, 61% of you have said you have changed what you're doing. 20% um, of you have not felt the need to change how you're managing data, and 17% said not yet, which I assume means that you expect that you will do. So um, I think that's, uh, I mean, perhaps we can ask our panelists at this point then to talk a bit about um, your own um, your own experience over the last 12 to 18 months and what is sort of what you think has changed in your companies in terms of the, the discussions and debates going on um, in, in, in terms of how we're managing our data. Um, Marilyn, can we start with you, please, on that one? Sure. Um, so for read exhibitions, uh, data and compliance is definitely the top three of our critical objectives. Obviously, show openings has been top <laughs> number one, which is no surprise. And then, of course, sustainability being number two. Um, what uh, working in a virtual and now a hybrid working environment has shown is, given that we've been working more virtually, um, has seen us uh, processing a lot more data. So more, more data is available to us as a company. And we're seeing there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of our strategic growth, using that data, having more insights into our customers and what our customers' needs are. And, um, but of course, as with anything, um, where it comes to data, uh, we're quickly establishing that, that customer trust is really important in order to, for us to keep having that data flowing to us so that we can um, leverage that as part of our strategic growth. Um, and part of, establishing that growth, uh, that trust is ensuring that we can demonstrate that we're a trusted custodian of personal information, but also other commercial information as well. So there is commercial information with our uh, customers in that mix. So um, it's more than just providing notices to people. It's more than just providing, we are promised that we will do this. It's actually demonstrating that and showing through our actions that we are taking this stuff really seriously. This is a board level issue. Um, so that's really key to establishing that trust. Thank you very much. Stefan, you, you have spoken on many UFI platforms about data and technology issues over the last several years, but you, you're, you're a newcomer to this particular panel that uh, kicked off in Rotterdam. So I'm gonna ask you perhaps if you could talk a little about, because uh, I, I know, 
it, the issue of data and data management is is one that's treated as a very strategic issue in in your own company at Easy Fair. So could you perhaps talk a little bit as well how you see things have changed over the last eighteen months? Well, I think the the question of the data ownership itself is pretty much settled now. Mm -hmm. um, we we know where we're going. We have discussed it with the everybody has discussed it with their providers. Everything is clearer now, and the change is that all the data we get through the digital channels and the virtual events channel and the online events has now joined the rest of the data and is treated like the rest of the data. And, and I think what, what has just been said is, is so important. The volume of data that we get has just increased by a factor of maybe 10 or, or 100 mm -hmm. because of those digital events and how we collect data on those events. So we have to learn how to, to use that. And as Marilyn was, was saying, it's, it's very tempting to use the data in any way we can to try to achieve any objective we want. And there's a difference between what is legal and what our customers actually want. And, and it's a challenge now to make sure that the data is used in, in a way that our customers would want the data to be used. Uh, and, and beside the legal framework, this is one of the questions we have at the moment is, what are the rules and policies that we want to put in place, not just to be legally compliant of course everybody wants that but to, to to have a fair use of the data and use it in the way that our customers would, would like it to use would like us to use it sorry yeah. thank you james can i ask you to jump in on that point because i think um, stefan raises a very interesting issue if we are looking at trying to make sure that we're using data in the way that our customers want us to use it how do we know that what's your what's where where do you um because it's it's not necessarily that perhaps that easy to find out but i think perhaps in in the sorts of work that you're doing that that may be an area you're looking at so do you have some thoughts on that in terms of how we determine what our customers are actually comfortable or want us to do with the data yeah, I mean, I, th I think first of all, with anything, not even just a conversation of data is, um, it's quite good talking to your customers, because they kind of tell you stuff that it's quite important for you to hear and listen and then then react to. Um, but to, to, to go on uh, Stefan's point, um, I absolutely agree, actually, it's making sure we're using that data how our customers want it to be used, and also how we're using their data to help um, build and design our next set of events or to ensure that actually we give them a service um, that, that is relevant to them because ultimately uh, if we don't listen to them don't engage with them then our community starts to decrease and once our community decreases our value and our asset is diminished and therefore actually our proposition um, starts to falter um, but I also think as well from a commercial point of view and we and we kind of touched on it a little bit um, at Rotterdam is actually how we're using data as part of our offering uh, to our sponsors and actually how we're lining our expectations of what that data looks like to our sponsors and also trying to ensure that um, we're not over promising on what they what they think they can receive so actually they pay us a lot of money perhaps and then actually when they get their end result it's very different to what they're expecting so it's really making sure that we're talking to our sponsors about actually what data means and when we say you can get access to data what that actually looks like uh, before they um, before they sign up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Sinead, if I can sort of come to you on this one as well. Um, I mean, how have you... Got back oh, yeah, we lost you for a minute there. Because you muted me, Caitlin. Obviously, you didn't like what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we will not be taking that question next. <laughs> Sinead, so if we could, um, so what, what I was <laughs> asking you was, um, was how, is the, um, uh, how have you seen this situation evolving in your own business in, in relation to what we're talking about there in terms of the, the, the volumes of data, the expectations of customers and the expectations of the, the people whose, whose data we're using. And what, is, is it clear to you that how that has been changing over the last 18 months? Have we lost Sinead? Sinead, you're on mute. 
Can somebody unmute Sinead? There we go. It just flashed up. I couldn't unmute myself. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, very similar to what the other panelists have shared. I think um, the quantities of data that we are now having access to have vastly increased. Um, and I think also the categories of data that we now have access to have also vastly increased. So, you know, we're all very used to, for example, dealing with names and email addresses. Um, we're not quite so used to dealing with um, behavioural insights. Um, so I think, you know, one of the challenges that we've got is now that we have this data, um, A, how do we make sure we're using it in a compliant way from a legal perspective and in a way that our customers expect, but also B, how do we actually use it? Because um, a lot of this data is data that we're not necessarily familiar with. Um, so there is a level of upskilling within our own teams in terms of understanding the capabilities of certain categories of data, and then trying to figure out whether or not we in fact even have the right um, technology solutions to process the data and to turn it into something which is useful and which our customers want. So I think there's there's almost two, two kind of streams of thought here. It's what, what can we do and what are we expected to do? And then how can we actually do that? Because this is this is not what we're this is not what we're kind of used to doing. No, absolutely. I think you you've spoken uh, in in Rotterdam that the in the upskilling that's been going on in all areas of the uh, of, of of the businesses in our industry now, in, including in, in in your sort of legal areas and and, and across yeah. the board. So sort of building on the point that Sinead was just making there. Um, and one thing that occurs to me is, as you just described it, Sinead, the data that we were traditionally used to using in our industry was very static. It was essentially a names and address database with maybe some more information attached to that, but it was very static. And we're now getting into a world with much more dynamic data. I mean, some of the service providers, the tech service providers are talking about providing real-time information to organizers and possibly even to some of your clients. Um, and I'm just wondering how that changes the picture if we're talking about data that's moving much more quickly and theoretically is available to you to look at and use in some ways almost in real time. I mean, is that, uh, is that a scary prospect? Is that something that you think we, you know, we, we, we will be coming up with? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's a scary prospect. I think I think it's an exciting prospect or we have to it might we might, it might feel like a scary prospect, but I think we have to turn it into an exciting prospect. Um, I think the idea that you can get real time insights um, is very valuable. And I think our customers would be very interested in that um, and it would be really helpful to them. Um, so, again, I think it's about us having sort of slick operating practices and technologies which allow those real-time insights to become available in real time but in a format in which people can use and and which is helpful to them um, so I think you know there's some investment there in terms of it's, it's all very well kind of getting the data instantly but putting it in a format that is helpful for people um, also requires an additional level of work um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's an exciting prospect, and I, some, I think it's something that our customers now expect. Um, you know, we live in a very real time, instant world, um, and you know, on the consumer side, you would expect sort of instantaneous, um, you know, insights. So just because we you know traditionally operate in predominantly probably B two B businesses, um, doesn't mean that that is not also the expectation because it's how we live the rest of our lives. Yeah. Absolutely. S Stefan, your CEO talks of a river of data was, I think, a phrase that he used when I spoke to him for Exhibition World the other day, uh, which suggests a much more dynamic world than the one that we were used to. You've been involved in this area quite a few years. Can you perhaps chat a talk a little bit to the sort of the challenges, both sort of practical, commercial, even legal, that you're aware of, of this much more sort of dynamic data environment that we're moving into now than where we were traditionally in our business? Well, it's, it's a tough question because there are so many aspects to it. 
I think that one of the biggest challenges that we have with the type of data that we have now um, is that we need to be better prepared. We live in a world where we use a lot of the data to do things after the event and make, you know, we make white papers and reports and, and, and exported files and things like that. We, we almost never live in a, if this happens, then this should happen right now world. Um, which we can now do with all of the data that we get. So one of the biggest challenges is to be able to react in almost in real time to what happens with the data. If somebody does this, or if they, if they have that type of behavior, then we should do that, or we should send this type of, of message, or we should put them in touch with this type of person, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's a big challenge because it's a, it's, it's a shift from where we came from, which was mostly using data for analytics um, and a little bit for marketing after the show, but no, it's really use the data to improve the customer experience right on the spot. So for me, that, that's one of the biggest challenge that we have. And when we talk about a river of data, we talk also about a data lake and all the rivers come into a lake. And, and one of the biggest technical challenges with these data lakes is for me, the, the freshness and the real time nature of the data that we get. Um, processing these volumes of data in a relatively short time and, and be able to react on the spot is something which is for me, the most difficult part of it at the moment. Thank you. James, perhaps sort of building on that a little bit as well. I mean, you, you have commented a bit about how you have been focused on trying to help, help your clients with the data. I mean, this, this sort of this more dynamic, this more immediate um, nature of the data that we have access to and are dealing with now something that's that's high on your list of uh, your agenda and how are you treating that yeah absolutely and um you know to use the analogy of how how fresh is the lake from stefan um you know well we know it's pretty fresh when we do an event we talk about the data we have it and it is instantaneous it's how we share that with clients and you know my last event i uh, had a um headline partnership with microsoft so it's it, it very very strong brand to use and it helped the event they were not interested in actually the physical data of the name, the email address and what company for a number of reasons. One is actually if it hadn't been uh, used within the last 20 days and they couldn't use it anyway, they're more uh, concerned about, okay, what those different types of data are doing and how are they reacting to the sessions and what is their interactivity? Um, so again, I think certainly in the B2B world now, there's no real kind of clear cut, just straight buyer seller relationship you know there's even more specifiers influencers you've got your your c-suite that might not necessarily actually be physically making the decision to buy your per, uh, your, your products all these different persona groups and and i think it's making sure that talking about the freshness of that lake how are we actually saying okay right of the whole community that were involved in this event actually these are the behaviors of these different personas and that's the information and the intelligence that, that a lot of the sponsors the larger sponsors for sure want to receive um, perhaps more so than actually, uh, as I say, just the name, email address. And, and I go back to kind of this industry, and I referred to our um, wonderful exhibition venues as Tin Sheds in Rotterdam. Um, so I'm going to uh, just stick stick with uh, our exhibition centres. If I look at a Jeremy Reese at Excel or his team, I don't think he would necessarily be interested in the names and email addresses of everyone or every organiser on this, uh, on this um, call because they already know us and they know who we are, but they will be very interested in actually what we're doing in, in terms of our activity and our engagement and immersement in the session. So, so for me, the, uh, that, that, that's the really, the, the biggest part I think we have to push and, and present to, um, to, to our customers. Thank you, Mar Marilyn. The, I think we're, we're already getting to a, a point clearly in this discussion where, we're, move, where we, we're seeing that we've moved on from the traditional types of data that we've been using and you, you I remember did talk about that in, in, in Rotterdam as well and just what sort of challenges and opportunities is that throwing up in the sort of the work that you're doing and trying to sort of help keep the, uh, the sort of the, the, the data streams that your businesses are generating pointing in the right direction? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, well, there's a couple of things here we need to bear in mind. At the moment, as is always the case in any organisation, this isn't unique to events industries, just so you are aware, whenever uh, data increases um, and we get excited, the idea is that we're like kids in a candy shop and we want to take it all. And actually, there needs to be a pause around 
what actually do we need to drive our strategies, our growth strategies? And um, because actually we don't need everything just because we can doesn't mean we should is always a thing I always say. Um, because you need to look at the technology can collect all this data, but does the individual necessarily expect us to collect this and know this about them? And this is particularly important when you're getting into the worlds of data lakes, um, because you can get so much insight from a data lake, which is fantastic from a commercial perspective, but does the individual necessarily know or expect us to have that kind of insight on them, which is really important that we're transparent about that, right? But also that we build in internal pauses around ethically, is this the right thing to do, not just legally? Because legally, you can always find ways and means to achieve certain things to a certain degree, but you do need to put in a pause around, is this ethically the right thing to do? Is this really gonna build upon that relationship I have with the individual? Um, and also important to have really good governance around how you're handling data at volume is really key. It goes down to even the basics of data tagging and things like that so that you can actually find the data that you've got in a lake. Because the problem with a lake is essentially it's a great big slosh bucket of information and it comes to a point where you collect so much information you're not able to search to the bottom of that barrel. Um, so that's really important that you need to look at, if you're looking at the big data at volume, you need to have really good data governance, making sure that you are not keeping information excessively, good retention periods, good data tagging, know how what's flowing in, what's flowing out, good data quality. You don't want to pollute your lakes. You want to make sure what's pumping in is good quality data because you're not going to get the insights that you're looking for. So there's lots of things to consider there. Yeah, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of things to consider. And I, I, I suspect that probably three quarters of the people on this call are currently scratching their heads saying, what's data tagging? <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but we may come back to that in a minute, because actually I'd like to stick with the, the issue of maintaining the confidence and trust. I think you were the first person to sort of mention that word in our discussions in Rotterdam. And it seems to me so important that you know, I'm just wondering, if, and perhaps we'll start with you, Marilyn, but then go to the other panelists on this issue and just ask for one or two suggestions on um, um, what, what techniques can we use that will help to both keep our clients and, 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 and attendees at our events aware of what we're doing and also comfortable with what we're doing. I mean, what, what, what can we actually do to help achieve that? Because I mean, if we just tell them some of the things that we think we can do and talk about this data lake, it's possibly gonna scare them. Yeah, it might be the creepy line <laughs> that you've crossed there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you've got to be careful how you word it, how, how you word things for sure. Um, I think the main thing is, where it comes to events, what happens is information, more information gets shared than maybe what the individual would otherwise expect. And I think it's being open and upfront when you're asking for information at the registration stage, you're um, what they call providing just in time notices. So if you're asking information that may be to an individual over and above what they would expect just to obtain a ticket to attend an event, then explain, just provide a little pop-up box that someone can click to say, why are you asking for that information? What are you gonna do with it? And how is it going to benefit them? If you're simply gonna say, oh, we're just gonna share it with our exhibitors or our sponsors, well, they're gonna say no, or they're gonna opt out. How is it going to benefit them that that information is being collected and shared with the exhibitor and sponsor? That all lends itself to trust because you're telling them what you're doing. If you're collecting information about individuals, you don't want to tell them about it. That normally tells you it's a good barometer that you shouldn't be doing it. So use that as a as a guide. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sinead, can we can I ask you to sort of talk to the same issue as well? Techniques, approaches, systems that you're finding helpful in sort of bringing the bringing the clients along with us in what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, to be honest, I, will, I would build on um, what Marilyn says. 
I think um, in order to gain that trust, then transparency is key. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately people, um, people in general do not mind, I don't think, their data being shared if it is in a useful way. So, and if it is in a helpful way, because why would people not want their life to be easier? So that they do want the right people having their data if it means that the right they then get connected to the right people and they hear about the right things. So I don't think um, I don't think there's this kind of underlying current of people don't want their data used for any purposes at all. I think. Um, but what you have to make sure that you're doing is ensuring that when when you are sharing that data, it genuinely is for a cause which is helpful to the person whose data it is and not our own purposes. Because there's lots of things we would like to do with the data, but actually that's, if, if it's not in the best interests of the customers, why are we doing it? Because ultimately this industry serves a network of people um, and it's those people that we need to look after, otherwise the industry doesn't exist. So um, again, yes, yeah, so similar to what, what Marilyn says, just being very transparent, um, particularly if the data collection goes over and above the norm about why that data is needed, how it's going to benefit that person, and yeah, how it's going to make their, their life easier and their experience on site at a show easier and enable them um, you know, to get a return on their investment, actually, because it's not, you know, it's not cheap coming to the shows. Um, so, you know, better for them to be there and for them to meet the right people and connect in the right way. Thank you. Great. James, can we, can you maybe talk from your own experience? I know you're, you're talking to your, your customers, but what, what, what sort of things have you been finding helpful in, in, in bringing people along with us in what we're doing here and, and, and ensuring that we maintain the trust of our attendees and customers on this. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's perfect timing actually, because um, as I was saying, we are now looking, we were able to get a lot more detail in the in the data or the personas of, of who, are, who are coming to our events, be it live or, or digital, from the questions we we're asking. And then the activities, I, I talked about that insight behavior, we can then start to really understand what's ticking the boxes of, of our clients. Um, and it's making sure we use that data when we're then marketing other events that we do as part of our business, that we're actually only marketing that, those that are relevant based on the information we have of our, of we have our data. Um, so I've been doing my Christmas shopping this week um, and I've bought my, uh, my wife's Pilates instructor and I bought a load of um, Pilates gear from a company called Sweaty Betty. Um, now Sweaty Betty know nothing other than my name and my email and uh, the fact that I've just spent a load of money with them. I've been inundated with emails of them from them since to the point where actually I'm just now fed up and I'm pissed off with Sweaty Betty and I've got no interest in ever using them again. But in Sweaty Betty's defense, they don't know enough about me and it's consumer, but we know a lot more about our customers. So actually, if we know that someone's been to a certain uh, event or they've engaged with a certain type of product, Let's not then market, blanket market them about other activities we're doing, which we know actually don't suit and engage with, with their interests. So we have this wonderful rich data. We have to actually make sure we use it properly to keep our customers um, involved with us. And, and Sinead's right, you know, I think people sign up because actually there's a legitimate interest for them to actually engage with us and understand how they can make their businesses better through the content we may deliver. But if we then kind of, misuse that data by offering them things that we know that they're not really interested in because we're being too lazy to actually segregate what we're doing that that's when we're um we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice so it's it's an act on the rich data we have we've never had data this rich before let's box clever and, and use it properly thank you thank you james step stefan before we move on um any thoughts from your own company's perspective of things that you've been doing things that you've found useful to help build trust of people who, from, from whom we are now collecting this, uh, this much richer vein of data that the others have been describing? Well, th th there's one principle that I always try to apply is that I, I try never to let people use the data in a way that I wouldn't want my own data to be used. <laughs> That's the first thing. The second thing is that there's a danger of what I call quantity for quantity in, when you deal with data. We're getting so much more data and there's a there's a risk 
that we are, we would be tempted to to sell more data or to provide more data to sponsors and things like that. While what we actually have to do is to is to transform that quantity into quality, and say we will we will not provide you with more leads than we did before. That's not the goal. We will provide you with better leads, and we will provide our visitors with better insights in which product might interest them and which people they might see. And that's the whole difficulty: is converting that quantity into quality, and not just saying quantity in equals quantity out. That's the most dangerous thing, I think. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. That picks up on the point that Marilyn made right at the beginning of this little yeah, stream of our, our discussion about sort of trying to keep fingers out of the cookie jars, basically saying you can, you, you can have everything, but it's not necessarily to your advantage, which is yes. what we try and tell our kids when they eat too many cookies, isn't it? Um, now, we have a question here coming in. Uh, if somebody can unmute Joanne Kellaway, so we'll say calling Sydney. I feel like a sort of a host of the Eurovision Song Contest here, calling Sydney. Um, Joanne, have you been unmuted? And can you ask your question to the panel, please? Yes. Hi, everybody. It, it is midnight, but, you know, <laughs> typical as part of the industry. I am a night owl. Um, first of all, I just want to say, James, I, I, I really agree with you. Um, what you were saying about Sweaty Betty, it's, it's really bad if you're overusing the data. But my question basically is around now that we've fully understood about the ownership, and I think, you know, as you all said earlier, that debate's over with, how are the organisers going in truly monetizing it in a purposeful way other than just you know, reading and understanding what's happening on the show floor. I'm interested to see whether organisers have yet started going down that journey of monetizing the data, remembering that other big companies like LinkedIn and Facebook and everybody else, um, you know, Insta, have already learnt that and are even building in ways to allow you to click and say, hey, I really don't want to see any more of that particular product because... I already purchased it or whatever it is, have organisers started to look at that and do they know if they're going to be doing that in-house themselves or do you think they will have to outsource that to a tech provider who would be potentially better able to monetize it for them? So just your thoughts on that. Sorry, it's a bit of a multiple-pronged question. No, it's, it's a great question. Thank you, Joanne, because it helps take us in, in exactly the direction we said we wanted this session to go, which is um, um, having, as you rightly say, really probably come up with a pretty clear answer on data ownership and not needing to flog that, that, uh, that sort of issue any further. What do we do with it? And ultimately, then what sort of a business opportunity is it? Um, Stefan or James, do you want to start on that? One of you want to jump in there? James, if you want, I can go after. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Stefan. Okay, I can I can go. So so we we are not at the point yet where we are already we have already commercialized product based on the data that we collect, um, and and to be completely honest with you, that's not top of priority list at the moment. What's what's top of the priority list is how can we use those data to make the experience and the the return on investment and the return on time of our events better for our customers, uh, both for online event and for face-to-face -face event. So, so for me, that, that's the most important point. Products will come, of course, uh, probably uh, in terms of, of more targeted lead generation and things like that. Uh, but at the moment, the, the best goal is to optimize what, what we do with the data. Um, on the second question of Joan, and, and great to see you, Joan, it's been a long time, hi. Um, it's, it's that at the moment we are at easy first, we are doing it ourselves. We don't rely on an external provider to do that. Um, and, and we have our own algorithm that we train for uh, matchmaking and things like that. Um, but I totally understand that it's the way we do it, but it might not be the best way for everyone to do it that way. Uh, but it's totally doable to do it yourself. Uh, it's a lot of work, uh, but at least you have, you have full ownership of what you do and you have full control over the way you develop your algorithms. You can mix and match all of the data from both online and uh, live events, which is sometimes difficult to do with, with platforms. But to be honest with you, it, it's also difficult because a lot of these platforms, they, they are very good at what they do. And, and, and you will be definitely, if you've not spent the past few years investing in data lake and artificial intelligence, 
catching up right now is very difficult. So probably it would be faster to do it. If you have not done that investment before, do it with a platform. Thanks very much, Stefan. James, any additional thoughts on that in terms of commercializing this data that we're talking about and whether you do it in-house or externally? Yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting if I've, I've got the question right. Um, I think, you know, almost, well, will almost be two years next March, 18 months ago when we all started doing, well, many of us started doing digital events for the first time. You know, the, the, the kind of the, the sell was to sponsors come in and we're going to give you all the data of everyone that kind of comes to our, uh, our event subject to GDPR. And then you've got to quickly realise, hang about, well, data is clearly our biggest asset. You're getting more data by coming to a digital event than you would be going to an exhibition, arguably. And as the customer, you're spending a lot less money sponsoring a digital event than you are spending making an exhibition stand, uh, building and, and, and the prices that we receive from our customers for their space rate. So there really is a fine line between how much you want to monetize that data uh, stroke actually if you monetize it so much and you're giving away data, does that customer actually need you for future years? Um, so, so for me, it's a fine balance. I think more than monetizing it, it's actually making sure we're using that data to enrich the customer journey, as Stefan mentioned, so that at the next events, which our customers, our sponsors will be will be with us at, we know it's going to be an enhanced event because we're using that data to, to enrich the experience um, and be it for the better of everyone else. But I'm... Uh, you know, it's interesting, I talked about Microsoft earlier on. I'm delighted, you know, when Microsoft said, actually, we're not interested in the actual data coming over to us because if it's not used in 15 days, we can't use it anyway. Um, because then you can actually get a lot more strategic with how you monetize what you're doing and how that data looks like with the customer rather than it being about trying to help someone build their own database. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered the question. It's very, very interesting. Just one, one question specifically from my, my own interest microsoft's 15 day cutoff is there is their view that data is worthless after 15 days then um i'm not sure it's worthless i think in terms of actually where they're doing and how they're storing data and it's just ensuring that they're not using data that somehow could have become stale or, or not fresh i think it's almost kind of that let's just be ultra ultra safe and ultra conservative and, and, and make sure we're just going nowhere near the line where it becomes a bit gray and should we be reaching out to them because they've not not had a legitimate interest for a certain amount of time um so not sure the reason why but but no no but it's in, you, it, it really is helped. it really helped because it's actually actually be more strategic with them indeed it's an interesting perspective again for people in the trade fair industry some of whom i suspect may have data in their databases 15 years old but anyway um <laughs> Um, <laughs> Marilyn, do you want to sort of pick up on that a little bit in terms of either the sort of the commercialization of this data and issues that that range raises? And al also, I think you did touch in Rotterdam a little bit about the, the balance between doing stuff in-house and outsourcing and the challenges that a lot of events companies are, are dealing with that at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just, you know, to speak, supporting what Stefan and James have just said. I think it's more than just um, commercialization because you have to sustain that customer. It's more than just having the customer at that one show. You want the relationship to continue. And um, so it's more about building the relationship between you and, and that customer, I think. And that comes with the insights that you get in. Um, does that actually lend itself to selling data in some instances possibly um, but you do need to sort of bear that in mind if when you start selling data then you start then triggering other requirements that you need to be aware of so like for example the California Consumer Privacy Act would require us to provide a way for someone to opt out of selling having their information sold to third parties and having a really detailed notice about where you're sharing that data with, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just worth bearing that in mind. And then um, speaking to leveraging the support, absolutely. So as much as we would love a massive, huge, and we do, we have a huge tech team, of course, our GTEC department, um, but we would always look for innovation solutions external to us because we're not able to create and build everything ourselves in-house all the time. So we, we want this small and medium-sized enterprises to do well so that we can leverage this innovation because we don't always think about everything in-house we've got some some amazing innovators in-house for sure but designs always come from external as well as internal so we need them to do well for sure but we need them to also be cognizant of the 
the way in which we treat data and, and the fact that, you know, there are requirements for us to follow in order for us to leverage their solutions. Thank you very much. Sinead, anything you'd like to add on that, just in terms of the challenges? I mean, particularly as you come specifically from the legal point of view, is, is the, I mean, uh, Mer Marilyn just sort of hinted at some of the issues that we have to grapple with there as we begin to look at commercializing this, uh, this data that we're collecting. I mean, is, it, it, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think Marilyn and I actually think quite similarly on um, a lot of these topics, but um, yeah, I think there is, um, this can sometimes be a lack of understanding around um, if we make this data available as a product and we seek to monetize it, um, it's not it's not just as easy as saying, here you go. There are consequences of that data being monetized in terms of additional levels of governance and compliance and transparency, um, all of which take time and cost to implement. Um, now, I, also similar to what Marilyn was saying, I would say that within Informa, um, we are certainly scaling up in terms of our data experts. So in terms of people who um, understand data, um, or whether that's from a legal compliance perspective or from a kind of technology solutions perspective. Um, but in terms of those actual technology solutions, so the infrastructure, whether that's software or platforms, um, equally, I think we would also for, look for those externally. Um, you know, we're, we're not a tech company. So we're probably, we probably don't have, um, you know, the brightest minds in terms of the development of technology products in-house. And that's, you know, because they, they work at the big tech companies, but, you know, all the smaller innovative tech companies. Um, so in terms of those tech solutions, I would say that they would probably come from in-house and, uh, sorry, from externally. And actually in many ways, you almost don't want them you almost don't want to bring them in house unless you are able to maintain them. Um, so there's, you know, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. I think, oh, well, why don't you just buy someone or something like that? But it's it's not quite as simple as that because as soon as they belong to an organisation, you then have to make sure that you have the people and the resources to ensure that it continues to be a cutting edge product or solution. Um, and, and there may be instances in which, you know, large events companies are the right home for um, technologies, um, but I don't think it's in all cases. So I do think um, this whole, you know, to be successful in this area, it's a combination between having the right people um, and certain level of resource in house and then working, um, you know, in, in partnership with our external partners who are also, you know, part of the events industry because they provide solutions, you know, for events. Exactly. Thank, thank you very much, Sinead. Um, so the UFI team, we're going to do a 15 hour time zone hop here from Sydney to somewhere on the east coast of the US. And can somebody unmute Glenn Hansen, please, so that Glenn, you can ask your question here, which I think sort of builds on this in terms of how we take these uh, data products and services out into the market. So Glenn, are, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Hello, everyone. Greetings from uh, Expo Expo here in Philadelphia. Um, exciting to see everybody back in live in person here in, in the United States. Uh, so yeah, my question sort of followed on to Joanne's, and that is... Um, when we think about LinkedIn, its investment in Hopin, for example, Amazon, Facebook, and the like, uh, do we envision that perhaps a few organizers in the same market category might get together and form a co-op for that market category and then share the data of the consumers in that, that market vertical as an experiment to see if that's a positive way forward to help the organizers compete with non-organizers in, in that vertical. Thank you, Glenn. Um, 
I suspect all of our panelists might well say you'll have to ask my CEO about that, but you're not, none of you is allowed to say that. So, uh, James, I'm going to go for you, to you first, and we, we will ask Simon what he thinks about that. But in the meantime, <laughs> perhaps you could let us know what you think about that and wh whether you think that might be a way, because I, I guess what Glenn's getting at there is if we start to compete in this business data world, we're up against some, some pretty mighty and some pretty well-funded players who are in the tech business and have been in the data business for many years. So we, we take ourselves off into unknown territories, don't we? Yeah, I, I think from, from Clarin's point of view, uh, we're in a fortunate position in that obviously we are um, one of the larger um, B2B, B2C exhibition organisers across the globe. So actually in terms of that, that co-op, Glenn, actually what we're doing now, we, we're using some external providers to actually look at all the data we have and the interactions they have and what content they're picking up, what newsletters they're reading, so then we can actually then start to share that data appropriately within, within our group subject to, to permission. So I guess in, in a way already we already have that co-op. Would we do it with other um, exhibition organisers? Um, but I think you know that's, that, that almost requires people to come together and say, hey, let, let's work together. But I, but I know from Clarence's point of view, we are, um, we are starting we're, we're well removed from the silos we all used to work in, you know, where you just had your show team and if someone else from a different show team wanted to use your data, absolutely not. We're, we're boxed a bit more clever to make sure we're, we're doing right what, what's right for the customer. So that kind of co-op kind of already exists from our point of view at, at the moment, just, uh, just internally. Stefan, any thoughts on that? Well, given all the effort that we've put in the recent months as an industry to, to own our data and not share it with the providers. Um, I don't think it would happen that, that large organizers would easily share data with each other. Uh, beside all the question of, of data ownership and, and data processing, et cetera, that, that the, the regulations puts on top of it and the fact that we cannot just share the data with, with other third party companies. Uh, even if we anonymize it in some in some cases, so I don't think I don't think this this has a good chance of happening. There are initiatives so that the the consumer, the, the end customer, can sh can have a shared profile across different organizers, uh, and there have been several companies launched doing that in the past two three years. Um, but the fact that the organizers themselves would share their behavioral data with each other, um, even if it's to compete with LinkedIn. We're still not sure that LinkedIn is going to be one of our competitors anytime soon, even though they have a small stake in uh, in Hopin, but it's very small. Um, I don't think it will happen. I, I don't see it happening short term. No, I, Mar Marilyn or Sinead, do either of you want to jump in with your thoughts on the sort of the pooling and, and sharing of data? Um. Yeah, I guess I would just probably flag that um, whether we like it or not, we um, are competitors of each other. So the idea of joining together in a co-op, um, which might potentially, I guess, um, you know, which would give each other access to data, but which some of the larger players might be able to use more easily than some of the smaller players could actually create um, kind of a further unfair competitive advantage. So I think there would actually be potential legal implications with implementing something like that, but maybe not impossible and, and maybe could, um, could be overcome, but I think it would require quite a lot of analysis over whether it was appropriate for us to have access to each other's information. Thank you. Marilyn, any additional thoughts on that before we move to wrap up? No, I, I agree with Sinead and, and all the comments that have been made and also just worth bearing in mind, to do that we would need the individual's consent and if the individual only has a relationship, say with Informa, why would they expect their information to be also processed by Easy Fares, RX and Claren? So, um, yeah, I think we, that will be a huge hurdle to jump, if I'm honest with you, even just with the individual themselves. Yeah. Well, well, Paul, with, with, with Informer and Reed being obviously the two larger players in our industry, um, I'm happy if they want to share their data with us <laughs> and then we will, uh, we will think about doing the same. <laughs> yes, quite Hands right. off, James. Hands yeah. off. <laughs> Very good. Um, 
we, we have about five minutes left now. Paul Grinnell had a, put a good question in there about ensuring everyone has transparency. How can we achieve our goals? I, I think we touched on that a fair bit earlier on in the discussion when we were talking about the sort of the techniques which we can use to, um, to, to achieve the levels of trust that we need to with our, with our clients and our, our users in this sort of fast changing world. So I think we perhaps, if you'll excuse us, Paul, won't come back to that. Well, it's a great question. And I think really is at the heart of much of what we've been discussing today. But given we've got three or four minutes left, maybe I can just ask each of you in turn, um, if you would let us know as we're coming up towards the end of the year here, and you're all, all we're all looking out to 2022 now. Um, what is the um, what do you think in terms of these data issues that we're looking at? What is the biggest challenge and what's the biggest opportunity for the next 12 months for the industry? Um, James, do you want to kick off with that? So I've, I've been unkind, I've been unfair to you because I've given the others a little more time to think about that as a simple answer. Biggest challenge, biggest opportunity, short answer for the next uh, 12 months. Sure, I think the, uh, the biggest challenge is understanding the data. Um, and actually how we're going to use it um, and how we improve that customer journey. I think that challenge is like any challenge we have as event organisers or organisers that bring communities together. How do we make sure that our community is best served? So that's that's one of the biggest challenges. I think the biggest opportunity, again, is actually how we build our, continue to build our communities outside of our events. Um, you know, the pandemic's not over. Um, I had to postpone an event in Japan that's due to run in the third week of January. I can't actually get dates for another until 2023 for that event. So actually, how am I using that data to keep my community engaged, even though they physically cannot meet each other until March 2023? And that the opportunity is, is to, you know, make sure we are a genuine 365 um, community kind of engaged business rather than uh, the three or four days of a show, maybe the two weeks before and two weeks after, yeah. um, as we were in the past. Thank you very much. Stefan, biggest challenge, biggest yeah. opportunity for the next 12 months? Well, I think it, they're both tied and it's in the sense that the biggest challenge for me is not to misuse all of the data that we, we have and all of the insights that we're getting more and more uh, with, with the first goal of just making more money. <laughs> for me, that's not the goal. And the biggest opportunity is to use all of that data to make our events, be them live or online, much more effective, much more enjoyable, much more relevant to improve that NPS score that of the exhibition industry, which that's not very good. Uh, and then the rest will come. Um, so, so yeah, the, the biggest challenge is not to take the shortcuts and say, oh, we have data, let's sell data, let's sell product with data, etc. And the biggest opportunity is, is we, we really have, we really can make our events much better than they were two years ago uh, because of everything. We, we've called for that digital transformation for years. No, it just fell on us like, like you know, <laughs> a, a piano that falls on you in a, in a comic. Um, and, and But we, we have to understand what to do with it. That's the biggest challenge and opportunity. Thank you. Sinead, how about you? Challenges and opportunities for the next 12 months? Um, I would probably say the challenge is the volume of data and the uh, opportunity is also the volume of the data. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the volume of the data in a challenge perspective, you know, how do we wrap our arms around what is now available and how do we understand it and segment it and streamline it um, so that we are picking out the useful um, parts to use? Um, and then similarly, the opportunity, what, it, you know, if we can manage to do that successfully, um, then we have a lot more data that we can make that is available to us, that is available to our customers. Um, that we can use to, you know, really enhance um, whether that's live or digital experiences. So, you know, to, to really sort of improve our offerings. Um, so yeah, I think volume and volume, basically. Yeah, I think Stefan talked of sort of a hundred times the volumes of data that we were working mm -hmm. with before. It's a really, it's a, it, it's that for me is the is probably yeah. well that that and the piano falling on our heads. But I suppose this hundred times volume is the piano falling on our heads. Yeah, Marilyn, and I, I don't you, think that is an exaggeration. No, I think so too. I think you're probably ab absolutely right, Marilyn. We're we're right on time here. So you, with your lovely Christmas tree, I think should have the last word on this session today so you're briefly from read exhibitions challenges opportunities in relation to data for next year 
I can only echo what the panel members have said this so far, but um, is also just to say the changing legislative landscape um, that's coming up over the next year globally is quite a challenge. The opportunity is obviously what the panel members have already said. So thank yeah. you. Listen, th th thank you so much to, to Stefan from Easy Fairs, to James from Clarion, to, to Clarion from Marilyn from, from Reed and Sinead from Informa. Really, I, I've really enjoyed this again, fascinating session. I think we've managed to build on what we talked on in Rotterdam. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, sort of um, best wishes for whatever you celebrate at the end of the year to everybody here. And Caitlin, I'm going to head back to you, hand back to you at this point. And oh, I'd love thank to be the last word. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just to echo what everybody said, thank you so much to Sinead and James, Marilyn, Stefan, uh, uh, and Paul for this session, as well as everybody who has been part of all of the sessions throughout the year. Um, like we said at the top, data ownership is dead. Uh, and now we will move on to a bit more what we can do with the data. So, uh, you know, general housekeeping things, any questions, unanswered questions, things you'd like to ask, media at ufi.org. Um, of course, we are on social. I'm sure you all follow us and all of that already. Um, and then uh, a last 2021 plug. Um, if you uh, are unaware of the Net Zero Carbon Events Initiative, it is a cross-industry um, initiative. It's not here held by UFI or anything. It's certainly um, a very collaborative collective group and it is all about how we will um, achieve these sustainability targets um, as a collective industry. So I really encourage you to have a look at that, um, which is netzerocarbonevents.org. And as always, thank you to our diamond sponsors who let us do things like these UFI Connects. So TSEB, Qatar, and Freeman. Have a happy new year. And any other festive things you do this year, uh, and we will see you in in 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you.